Okay, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for those of you that have been here all three nights, and for those of you that have been here two nights, and for those of you that have arrived for the first time tonight. Welcome. It's good to have you. Um, so before I give the talk, uh, A Matter of Life and Death, A Battle for True Education, um, I want to very quickly, we did talk about this pilgrimage to England that Father Beerbaum and I are leading. Uh, we're pl still planning this September. Father's been on the phone to the tour company today and um, you know that we have until May to, to absolutely definitively confirm that we've got to go this September as opposed to next September. So th that being so, we're hoping by May the COVIDiest fog the Covidius fog will have lifted somewhat and people will feel confident about traveling. So um, I'm hoping that you will um, put your name on the list that Father has back there so that we know the level of interest here. I'm going to start promoting it also on my own website. So very quickly, I want to go through the itinerary that we have. So um, uh, we're going to leave here, uh, leave the United States uh, on September the 15th, which is a Thursday. We're going to arrive in London. Um, we're going to visit the Tower of London, and um, we will be hoping to visit the cell in which St. Thomas More spent his final days before his execution. Um, and um, we hope to take in the Globe Theatre, um, and uh, obviously we'll be celebrating Mass every day. That should, that should go without saying. Uh, on the second, the second day in England, we'll be in London all day long, and uh, again, too many things to list, but... Uh, Westminster Abbey, the, 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 the tomb of Sir Ed, St. Edward the Confessor that I mentioned in my, uh, during Masses. Um, and then Sunday, we'll, we'll also be in London. We're going to have Mass at Brompton Oratory, which is one of the most beautiful liturgies you're likely to experience. We're going to have uh, dinner in the Old Cheshire Cheese Pub, which is a pub which is hundreds of years old on various levels of cellar bar where all sorts of good people um, imbibed good ale and ate, including G.K. Chesterton, Hilaire Belloc, uh, Dr. Samuel Johnson, the romantic poet Shelley and Byron and people like that. So we'll be in good ghostly company as we have our dinner. And then on, on, on the day five, we'll go to Canterbury, Canterbury Cathedral, and obviously where St. Thomas Beckett was martyred in 1170. Then we'll go to Cambridge, we're going to go to Walsingham, the shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham that I've been speaking about. We'll be going to Castle Lake of Priory, a beautiful village. But I should say one thing, by the way. This, these are places that if you just go by yourself, you won't know about. If you go by a, a, a regular tour company, they won't know about. <laughs> so this is actually a genuine pilgrimage to places that are wonderful, that are just not, not on anybody's radar. So Castle, Pri uh, Castle Acre, where I lived, uh, I actually lived there for a while, it's so a village green, an 11th century church. One end of the village is a, the ruins of a, Cluny, a Cluniac priory, destroyed by Henry VIII. The other end of the village is the ruins of a Norman castle. Uh, and I actually lived in a, a cottage there, which was built from the stones from the castle. And it's the, the cottage was, from, was uh, dated from the 14th century. Um, so, and Cambridge, of course. And then we go to Stratford-upon-Avon. Uh, I've written three books on Shakespeare, The Evidence for William Shakespeare's Catholicism. So, and the, one, the other thing I'll be doing, by the way, I will be giving talks on the bus trip. So we may have a longer bus trip from one part of England to the other, and we're going to be on the bus for an hour and a half. I will actually be giving talks uh, so you, you, you can go to sleep if you want. Um, I won't be offended. Just don't snore. Um, and then we're going to go to High Clare Car. We're going to go to Oxford. There's so many things to see in Oxford. I hope to visit the graves of both Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. Obviously, we have the colleges, we have the Bird and Baby pub, where Tolkien and Lewis used to uh, meet. And there's a wonderful walk we can do along the river to another pub they used to go to, um, past the yeah, very significant sites. And at Father's special request, we're going to sp spend uh, a day at Downton Abbey. Uh, so uh, that's, that's the populist TV aspect of it. Um, Highclere Castle is actually the place that Downton Abbey was filmed, and that's where we'll be going. It's close to Oxford. Then we go to Arundel, which is the, the homes of the Dukes of Norfolk. Arundel Castle is marvellous. Um, uh, Arundel Cathedral is marvellous. Uh, the Dukes of Norfolk were the, the, the aristocratic family that stayed true to the faith throughout the, those 300 years of persecution that I alluded to. And I'm leaving loads of things out here. Um, and then after all that, on day nine, we return to the good old United States. So um, if you're interested, again, please let Father know. About signing, the, filling the form, or some, by some other method. And also, by the way, when we get to the Q and A session, 
uh, father, cough ostentatiously at the appropriate moment, okay? Because, um, again, I don't have a, uh, any way of knowing how long I'm speaking for here. But when we get to the Q&A session, please do feel free to ask questions about the pilgrimage as well um, as the content of this talk. So a matter of life and death, the battle for a true education. So when we want to talk about education, we have to begin with probably the most important question that we need to ask, and not just ask, but answer, if we're going to talk about education in a meaningful sense. And it's one of the most famous questions ever asked. Quid est veritas? Who said that? Pontius Pilate, yes. What is truth? Now, the key thing is that it's not, the answer to that question depends upon the way you ask it. Because you, there's two ways you can ask it. One is a, a healthy way, and the other is an unhealthy way. The way that it's normally asked in our secular education system is quid est veritas. What is truth? It's unknowable. Either it doesn't exist, or we can't know anything about it anyway, so let's not worry about things like that. Let's worry about getting on with the useful things in life. So quid est veritas. Or you can ask the question, quid est veritas? What is truth? As a question that not only needs to be asked, but needs to be answered. And of course for the Christian, it's not a difficult, it's not a difficult question to answer because the, the answer has been given. And that's those words from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was asked quid est veritas. He didn't answer Pontius Pilate, but he did answer the question elsewhere when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So quid est veritas? Jesus Christ is veritas. So a true education has to be an education as if truth mattered. So the whole idea of leaving God or Christ out of an education is to basically condemn it to death from the very beginning. Those who don't believe in truth cannot breathe life into education. They can only kill it. This is why it's a matter of life and death, and it's why it's a matter of what leads to either the culture of life or the culture of death. It's one of the crucial questions we need to ask. I'm going to recap a little bit on the talk yesterday, the evangelizing power of beauty. So for those of you who were here yesterday, then this will just be a reminder to contextualize it within a discussion of education. Um, so, quidest veritas, Jesus Christ is, is, is veritas, but of course the the, pr the truth is also Trinitarian, because God is Trinitarian. And we discussed yesterday how the ancient Greek understanding of the transcendentals, the good, the true, and the beautiful, is a manifestation of the Trinity. And indeed, the, the words of Christ, I am the way, the truth, and the life, is a Trinitarian allusion to the good, the true, and the beautiful. The way is the way of goodness, the truth is the way of reason, and beauty is the way of creativity and seeing the harmony in the cosmos. Because God is all three of those things. God is love, God is reason, and God is beauty. So in, 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 in a, a straightforward sense, um, that to love is to give yourself freely to another. That's what God does in creating us, and in creating us in, in his image, we are meant to do the same. That's what love is. God is the logos, the ratio, the reason. All reason uh, points to him because all reason is him. That's why the Catholic Church has always insisted on the indissoluble marriage of fides et ratio, faith and reason. And then God, as we discussed yesterday, is the great creator. He's the great poet. That the cosmos is a work of beauty, a work of art. It's not merely a mechanism. God's not a mechanic. 
He's an artist. He creates something which is beautiful and harmonious. So if reason, love, and beauty are the end to which we strive, both in life and in education, they are also the means by which the end is achieved. If God is love and we want to get to God, we get to, to, to the God who is love by acts of love. If God is the Logos, if God is reason, we get to God through the use of reason. And if God is the creator who creates beautiful things, we're meant, first of all, to be able to see beauty and to do it. We made in God's image, we made as creators ourselves. Human creativity is the mark of the image of God in man. The imago dei, the imagination. Being able to make things. So, Love requires an education in virtue. A secular relativistic education has exorcised virtue from the classroom. We can't talk about things being virtuous because it's judgmental. People have to be able to make up their own mind about what's good and what's bad. There is no objective good and evil. Well, let's get really radical about this. That which is good is is rooted in selflessness, in giving ourselves to others. That which is not good, in other words, evil, is selfishness, refusing to give ourselves to others. The first is the act of love, The second is the act of pride, the refusal to love, the making of ourselves God and sacrificing everything else on the altar we erect to ourselves. That's the relativistic root of modern education, and it leads ultimately to anarchy. And we should say, by the way, we don't have to worry about destroying evil. Don't spend any of your life being anxious about destroying evil, because evil is always in the process of destroying itself. The culture of death is suicidal. Of course, it takes down lots of innocent victims on the way. And we can worry, if you like, about the innocent victims, although not to the extent that we despair. So, if love requires an education in virtue, the most important thing at the heart of any true education is that you have to give yourself to others. That a true education also requires an education in reason. We, if we don't know the difference between um, uh, truth and opinion, we're going nowhere. Someone said to, to uh, Chesterton, or someone said, the Chesterton responded, that truth is one's own opinion of things. And Chesterton said, said the man who thought he was a rabbit. Clearly, reality is something which is, whether we like it or not, and we either conform ourselves to it or we suffer the consequences of failing to do so. So, an education in reason requires, in practical terms, a rational approach to the primal things. The most primal thing of all is, does God exist? So, first of all, a rational approach to God's existence. So, that's philosophy. And if you come to the conclusion, which the great philosophers do, that God does exist, the next question is, well, God does exist, can he reveal himself? And the answer to that question is, yes, of course he can reveal himself. And then, would he reveal himself? That's perhaps a question we can't answer as easily. What we can say is, has he revealed himself? And of course he has, in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the establishment of the church, and the 2,000 years of history since then. So theology and philosophy have to be part of a true education. History has to be part of a true education. 
And one thing that the modern world and modern education has vanquished history. And there's a very, easy, very good reason for that. If you want to create a new man in the image of an ideology, you have to look towards an imaginary future and worship that. As Chesterton said, the wall of the future is a blank wall. There's nothing on it. Which you can write on it whatever you like. But the wall of the past is already full of writing, which you have to take into account. And if you write things on that wall which contradict what's already there, then you have to be able to explain why you're doing that. That history is the collective experience of humanity. The mistakes, the mistakes that are learned, the mistakes that are not learned and therefore are repeated ad nauseum, the discussions about what is true, the very debate of quid est veritas, what is truth, that's been going on for 3,000 years. It's been going on for longer. There's the other thing about history where we have to understand there's two ways of uh, understanding history. History as everything that's been recorded in the past. And the other understanding is history as everything that's happened in the past. And it's not the same thing. Because everything that's been recorded in the past um, are only pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. And many pieces of that jigsaw puzzle are missing. We don't know them. But you can... By seeing the pieces that we do have, you can get some idea of the picture. But if you say, we don't care about the jigsaw puzzle, the past basically stinks. Yes, largely it does. But it doesn't just stink. There are people that, 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 uh, that spoke truth. There are people that act virtuously. There are people that created beautiful things that we can learn from. And yes, we can learn from the mistakes. We can learn, for instance, that if you believe that you can uh, abandon the past and create a future based upon a, a secular fundamentalist ideology, you can have a French Revolution. You can have the great terror that follows the, follows the French Revolution. You can have the invention of the guillotine to kill civilians. And if you don't learn that lesson, you can have another French Revolution, but this time we'll have it in Russia, with basically the same principles, the same socialist principles, where you, don't, you, you, you abandon the past completely for a belief in an imaginary future. And you have, a, you have a Russian Revolution that kills millions of people, and a Chinese Revolution with the same ideology, which kills millions of people. Or if you don't like international socialism, Marxism, you can try National Socialism, Nazism, which is still socialism, also believes in abandoning the past. All of these creeds have in common secularism, a belief that salvation is to be found in the world and not with God. They're fundamentally materialistic. And the death count, the body count, for these efforts to, to abandon the past to wipe out the past, to refuse to learn the lessons from the past, to refuse to learn the lessons of history, the body count by conservative estimates of communism in the 20th century is about 100 million, most of whom were civilians, most of whom were killed by their own government. How many people are being taught in secular schools in this country about the evils of the French Revolution, or the Russian Revolution, or the Chinese Revolution, or the Nazi Revolution. No, the past doesn't matter. It's all about the future. Well, in that case, as people, the people have said that in the past, have killed 100 million people, we can, we can probably expect that the people that haven't learned the lesson will do the same thing in the future. So history 
is essential to understand our own story, what we've done, what lessons can be learned from what we've done. And it is, after all, only living in communion with ourselves, with our brothers and sisters who lived before us. Because as Chesterton said, the tradition is democracy. It's the proxy of the dead and the enfranchisement of the unborn. We need to listen to our brothers and sisters, those that have lived in the past, especially as the whole of history is played out in God's presence. That there is no future for God, there's no past for God, there's, there's only the present for God. So the people living in the 15th century are present to God. People living in the 23rd century are present to God. The whole thing's playing itself out in front of him. We have to be part of that communion of our brothers and sisters, that communion which we call humanity. And that's why, of course, we talk about these subjects using reason and education as the humanities. The thing about the humanities is they teach us about humanity. We have an obsession these days with education. The concentration has to be on the STEM subjects. Science, technology, engineering and math. That which is useful from the point of view of getting a job. Well, if you want to get a job and keep a job, it's also useful to be able to understand who you are as a human person, who the people you work with are as human persons, how to communicate what you know to other human persons. So even from the perspective of being useful in this purely utilitarian sense, the humanities are necessary. Literature. And again, as I said yesterday briefly, all of these are sciences. All of the humanities are sciences. Because the Latin word scientia just means knowledge. In the medieval times, theology was the queen of the sciences, the queen of the various branches of knowledge that lead to truth. Now, with literature, the first one to talk about literature is words. You can have money and it may do you good and it may not. But every additional word that you learn and you acquire is wealth. Because words are what we used to think. And the more words we have, the more clearly we can explain ourselves to ourselves, the things that we experience to ourselves, the things that we experience to others. Now, there's a really sort of stale Latin word vocabulary. That's not very exciting. But the Anglo-Saxons talked about each individual person having their own unique word hoard. All of us have a unique amount of wealth. Not in dollars, in words. And the more words we have, the more we can make sense of things. We live in a society now where people are illiterate. If you don't have the words, you can't explain the situation you're in, you have frustration, you have anxiety, you have despair, you have violence. Because you don't understand. You don't understand because you don't have the words. So, love, reason, beauty. Love, any education that does not teach virtue is poisonous. Any education that does doesn't teach the necessity of reason is poisonous. But what about beauty? Because beauty requires an education in and an engagement with the beauty of God's creation, nature, and also the fruits of humanity's sub-creation, the arts. We have to see, first of all, the beauty in the cosmos. We don't see a sunrise and see that it's something which is, shows, shines forth the splendor of truth in beauty. We're not seeing it at all. 
Now, I mentioned yesterday, and I'll say it again, because this is at the heart of all perception. You cannot have an education unless you're perceiving things. So Thomas Aquinas says that all perception is rooted in humility. If you have humility, we'll have a sense of gratitude. That sense of gratitude opens the eyes in wonder. If our eyes are opened in wonder, we move to contemplation. And it's only when we move to contemplation that we experience the dilation of the mind and the soul into the fullness of reality. If you like the five other senses of how we actually perceive. Humility, gratitude, wonder, contemplation, dilation. So again, the modern secular education is rooted not in humility, but in pride, which is the absence of humility. That's the actual definition of it. So at the heart of modern secular education, there is no sense of gratitude. There's a sense of resentment, the sense of empowerment, sense of me, there's the, the unholy trinity at the heart of modern education, me, myself, and I. So a, a, an education that teaches you that you are the center of the cosmos and you can do what you like, that teaches you to be narcissistic, will prevent you from seeing anything. Because your eyes will be closed shut in prejudice against anything which you find uncomfortable or distasteful. So again, this whole idea which we get from the church, and again, Chesterton says the Catholic Church is the one continuous institution that's been thinking about thinking for 2,000 years. 2,000 years of engagement with what's happening in the world, with intellectual history, all the various ideas and heresies the church has responded to. Most of the new ideas are just old heresies with new names. So, we have to be able to see beauty, but we also need to do beauty. So, a true education is not just an education in virtue, an education in reason, an education in wonder. It's also an education in not just reading poetry, but writing poetry. Not just reading stories, but writing stories. Not just looking at sunsets, but painting or drawing sunsets. Not just listening to music, but playing music. So a true education has to uh, incarnate the image of God in us through the use of our own creativity. All right, now, the other way of, of looking at uh, the true education as a matter of life and death is to see what happens if we don't have it. And I have a good, great deal of experience about bad education because I had one. In actual fact, um, I have, I, the school that I went to in, in England, Eastbury Comprehensive, embarking in Essex, um, there was a there were about 15 or 20 years ago, there was a, a, um, a survey of all the educational district, districts in the United Kingdom, and Barking and Dagenham, the area that I lived, came bottom. It's the worst educational district in the whole of the United Kingdom. And Eastby Comprehensive, my school, came bottom of the list. So I have a real claim to have gone to the worst school in England. That's a claim to fame, isn't it? Um, so listen, so I have, I have first-hand experience of what a what bad education is, which is one of the reasons I'm so passionate about a good education. And the bad education at my school was actually summed up with the school motto. So imagine now, instead of being in a, in a church in Colorado, you're at the school auditorium at Eastby Comprehensive in Barking, Essex. And behind here is the school motto in great big letters. This, above all, to thine own self be true. Who said that? Alistair Crowley's a good answer, but <laughs> that's not the answer I'm looking for. Any, who else? Sorry, anyone? It was in Hamlet. Okay, it's in Hamlet. Good. Polonius is the answer. But 
My school, this above all to her own self be true, William Shakespeare. Now my father, now I wasn't raised as a Christian particularly, we never went to church, never prayed. My, for my, for my father, the, 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 the best thing to be in the world, the only thing to be in the world was an Englishman. So he, he used to teach me there were only three types of people in the world. So there were Englishmen, there were those who would like to be Englishmen, and there were those who don't know any better. Now for my father, who you know, we weren't particularly Christian, the greatest Englishman that ever lived was William Shakespeare. So I basically raised from my father's knee, nothing is bigger or better than William Shakespeare. So I knew I was getting a bad education. But I thought, at least I can live by that school motto. This above all to our own self be true. And what I didn't realize at the time was that William Shakespeare never said that. He wrote that. But Polonius said that. And Polonius is a blithering idiot. And he's not just a blithering idiot, he's a traitor. He's a poisonous traitor. He runs a spy network. It's basically try, aiming to bring down Hamlet. A spy network in service of a king who's killed his own brother. Had an adulterous relationship with his sister-in-law. And is plotting the murder of his nephew, Hamlet. So Polonius, in service of this wicked king, gives that advice to his son, Laertes. Laertes is about to go off to college in Paris. So Polonius thinks this is a good time to give him you know, the facts of life, the most important things, the precepts of life. So there's no mention of God. There's no mention of love. No mention of self-sacrifice. No mention of virtue. It's all about choosing the right friends. Don't borrow money. Don't lend money. Wear the right sort of clothes. Don't get in arguments. But this above all, to our own self, be true. Now, that's relativism. That above all else, the only thing that matters is you're true to whatever you think yourself is. And as G.K. Chesterton said, the self is more distant than any star. Good luck. Especially if you, have, you don't see yourself in relation to something bigger than you, like God. If you are God, and you're trying to understand yourself, good luck. But I did that. So as I said in answer to a question on, on, on Saturday evening, that at the age of 15, I joined a white supremacist organization in England. I was full of hatred. I went to prison twice. But above all else, I was being true to myself. Now, I can condemn myself now from the perspective of being a Christian, but... A relative shouldn't be able to condemn me if I'm doing exactly what I was told to do. So I know what a bad education is. I experienced it. Secularized education excludes virtue, theology, philosophy, any history beyond an ideological straitjacket understanding of it. And perhaps very importantly, it excludes the great books of civilization. So a classical education is about the great books, these books that change the world. The correct word really is not just the great books, but the great conversation. What are the greatest geniuses, the greatest minds, the greatest storytellers, the greatest seers of reality? What have they said for 3,000 years? How have they responded to each other? We commune with those people. We recognize that some, some people have actually known more than we do. 
That's quite important for the beginning of an education, is to accept, actually, that some people might know more than you do. And to want to learn from them. To want to be part of this living tradition. To be in communion with our brothers and sisters across the centuries. To be in love with them in the sense of giving ourselves to them, laying down our lives for them self-sacrificially that we may learn from them. The true education is about this above all, being true to the truth that is beyond the self. In other words, true education has to be selfless, not selfish humble and not proud. And it's so important that our children will either be lost in the darkness of the culture of death because of relativism, or they will become beacons of light, leading others out of the darkness. So there are some very good, exciting things going on. Um, The Cardinal Newman Guide Colleges, I've had the pleasure of teaching at several and speaking at many of the others and a whole networks of good classical academies growing up around the country. This is a, the act, actual practical response that we need to the culture of death and the education of death, which it is forcing upon our children. The restoration of a true education is crucial to the future of life on earth. That which is rooted in the past will blossom in the present and will bring forth beautiful fruit in the future. That which is rootless withers and decays in the present, decadence, and dies in the future. There is no future for this culture. The culture of death is destroying itself. The question is, what's going to rise from the ashes? And what will rise from the ashes is what we put in place now. Because as things get worse, as things get darker, every candle will be attractive. So Chesterton said that the modern... Modernity, the modern man, is like a supercilious cad who contemptuously kicks down the ladder by which he's climbed. And he also says that man is a strange animal that can only move forward by looking back. And the poet Roy Campbell has one of my favourite metaphors for all of this. He talked about society is like a car. He said the steering wheel is wisdom the accelerator is progress, and tradition is the brakes. He said, we live in a society which has thrown away the steering wheel and refuses to use the brakes, and has his foot hard down on the accelerator. Well, we know where that's ending. So our job as educators, and as educators I mean parents as well as school teachers, people involved with education in other ways. Our job as educators is to teach our students, our children, how to drive through life using the steering wheel and the brakes as appropriate that they might become fully human and help others to become fully human. That's what the humanities do for us. They help us to become fully human. To be fully human is to love the good and know the truth and to see and admire beauty that we may become lovingly and truly beautiful. When loving and living become the same thing, we will be truly rational and truly beautiful. This is the ultimate goal of a true education, as it is the ultimate goal of life itself. Thank you.